Welcome everyone. Today we're granted with a very special guest. Um, uh, you know, th this is our another episode of our forum series. Um, today I have Mr. Mosler, uh, a very Nick. I think you can introduce him better yeah. than me. So go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for coming into the stream. I'm more than excited to introduce our guest today by the name of Warren Mosler. Warren is one of the founders of MMT. Has made many great contri contributions to economic thought. I think it's fair to say that Warren has been an inspiration behind a lot of soft Dems who uh, subscribe to MMT in the community, including myself. I want to thank you, Warren, for taking time out of your day to come on this forum with us, answer some of our questions about uh, fiscal monetary policy as well as MMT in general. Um, and uh, I'll just hand it off to Warren. Very good. Thanks. Nina. Good to be here. Good to see this kind of interest, uh, especially from people your age, because probably about when I started doing this and now at age... 71 it's finally getting out there so this stuff takes a long time and uh, i just have to keep at it keep at it so i, th I think i'll i want to kick it off by uh giving it just two things so th and these are two things that the uh, mainstream has backwards and the, these are the key things that mmt is trying to turn around this backwards thinking the first one and the most important is that the government the u.s government congress has to get money to be able to spend. The way they say it, we have to tax to, to get the money, and hear that, get the money to be able to spend. And what we don't get from taxes, then we have to borrow the money to be able to spend. So they have to tax or borrow to get the money to be able to spend. And they borrow the money from the likes of China and leave the debt to our grandchildren and this type of thing. When President Obama was asked when the government was run out of money, he said, we're already out of money. We're borrowing from China. And he and his staff uh, actually took a trip, trip to China to talk to our bankers about making sure we could continue to get the money from China. Well, what MMT has pointed out for the last 30 years now is, is that that's entirely backwards. Okay. The money to pay taxes that people use to pay taxes, the money that people use to buy government bonds comes only from the government through its agents. So it's, let's just say it comes from the government, the federal government, not the state governments, not the local governments. The money to pay taxes comes from the federal government. So if it comes from the federal government, the idea that they have to get money to be able to spend doesn't make any sense. And in fact, the people I've worked with in the Federal Reserve, all the senior operations people absolutely understand this. This is their job. To to recognize you know, the flows of the funds and where they come from. And so to them, it's not even a point of discussion. But to every politician I've ever spoken with, uh, every legislature, they, they've had this thing backwards. And so they, uh, and, and that kind of backwards thinking is what dri has been driving policy. And it's only changed in the last couple of years due to uh, all the MMT proponents out there making noise and letting uh, policymakers know directly and indirectly that got this thing backwards. So what does that mean? It means that, uh, that what, what is the public debt? What is the money they're borrowing? The important thing is that they have to spend first before they can borrow it. So the, the way to look at the flow of funds, the flow of money from the federal government is not that they collect taxes first because the money to pay taxes comes from the government. They spend first. They put money in bank accounts first when they spend. And then some of that money gets subtracted from your bank account for tax payments. And the rest stays in your bank accounts and shifts to different bank accounts. And that's what's called the public debt. The public debt is nothing more than the dollars the U.S. government has spent that haven't yet been used to pay taxes and remain in bank accounts until they get used to pay taxes. Now, the one of the largest bank accounts that they stay in are uh, called securities accounts at the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve is a bank, just like any other bank. They have what a normal bank would call checking accounts and savings accounts. And all those U.S. government bonds you hear talk about, they're nothing more than savings accounts at the Federal Reserve Bank. You give them money, and then at some point later, they give it back with interest, just like any other bank with, with a savings account. So the money's not gone. It's still dollars in a savings account at a bank. Okay, so the, so the government spends first and puts it in checking accounts. Some is subtracted to pay taxes. And the rest winds up uh, being shifted to 
savings accounts at the Federal Reserve called Treasury Securities. And there are $28 trillion in these savings accounts at the Federal Reserve. That is the money supply, the net money supply. The money, it's dollars in a savings account is the money. So the question of how do you pay it back? How do you pay back what? Pay back the money? It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. It already is the money. What paying it back means is to shift it from a savings account to a checking account. And both accounts are at the Federal Reserve. So when the Treasury bonds come due and they have to be, quote, paid back, they just subtract the money from your savings account and put it in your checking account. They, and, and in technical terms, they debit your securities account and they credit your reserve account. That's how they say it, shift from savings to checking. Give it a fancy name. Okay, the second thing that's critical, and now the fir that first thing is now, there's now more awareness of that. We spent $3 trillion originally, and nobody even talked about where's the money going to come from or how are going to pay for it. They understood that. Uh, the next concern is what happens if interest rates go higher. And first of all, they all know that the Federal Reserve sets the interest rate. So why would the Federal Reserve possibly, you know, why, why would it ever want to raise interest rates? It's because they think that raising interest rates fights inflation. And again, what I've been saying for a very long time is they have that backwards. When you raise interest rates, it causes inflation to get worse, not better, <clears throat> through uh, two different channels. For the first thing, it causes the government to pay more interest on all those savings accounts. So that's just raw spending without anything on the other side. It's just throwing money out the, at the economy and presumably an economy where there's inflation. So if you're just throwing more money out by paying more interest, makes it worse. And the second thing, which is a little more difficult to understand, are called forward pricing channels. And that means if you want to buy a house, and it's going to take a year to build it. Uh, if interest rates are 10%, uh, for example, as they were back in the 70s, then that house is going to be more expensive because the builder has to you know, borrow money to get start building the house and put it all together, and he has to pay 10% interest. The person who's producing the lumber has to uh, pay 10% interest to, you know, to, to run his company, and the investors want at least 10% interest on any investments in these companies. Otherwise, they can just put their money in the bank and earn 10%. And so that interest rate is a force that drives up prices. But the important thing you need to know is that raising rates causes inflation to go higher. Okay, so now we have a government that's recognizing that they can deficit spend, they can spend whatever they want. They don't have to worry about the government going broke or becoming insolvent because it's spending first. It's putting money in your checking accounts first before that money is used to pay taxes or to buy bonds. So they sort of got that part okay. But they're holding back and they're worried about what might happen if the Federal Reserve ever decided to raise interest rates to fight inflation. Okay, and so why would they be worried about that if they knew the truth that raising interest rates makes inflation worse? Then, then that worry goes away. And then you're home free to propose and implement uh, progressive agendas. And it's these two things that I've watched for the last 30 years um, block the progressive agenda and, and it's elements of both political parties and all third parties uh, who all have this backwards that are all blocking the progressive agenda, uh, particularly the headline, what I call the headline left. Uh, these are people who are headline left, left uh, leaning people, headline progressives who try to support Medicare for all, who try to support public education. And they lose the arguments because they concede uh, that the government uh, has to get the money to be able to spend, that we might have to raise interest rates to uh, fight inflation. And so what MMT is doing is opening the door to removing these obstacles from uh, public policy. Okay. Sorry. All right. Got it. Sorry, I just have to change the layout. Um, if that's it, we're going to go to questions now. Um, so um, whoever wants to start, I almost have removed you from the stream. That would have been really bad. <laughs> um, all right. So Nick, you want to start? Uh, yeah. Uh, I was maybe one question that I could get into. I guess like for other people is like what uh, originally uh, inspired uh, your thinking behind MMT. 
I think that could be good for people first getting into. Okay, so I didn't have any reason to think in this direction for a long time. You know, first earlier part of uh, my career, I started in the 1970s in a small savings bank and then got a job at a brokerage house and then went on to Wall Street. I worked at Bankers Trust on the, uh, which we, we were one of the larger primary dealers and I was on the uh, dealer desk. And so I got to work with people who were always, let's say, trading money and uh, working with government securities and uh, on a primary dealer basis. So we were covering the largest accounts in the nation and uh, we're, had, we were covered by the Federal Reserve. We had lines to the Fed and we were uh, right in the middle of the entire dialogue about monetary policy, interest rates, and that type of thing. And over the years, certain little aspects of it became apparent to me that the other players hadn't thought of. This is before it became, let's say, full-blown MMT, just smaller things like when the Fed tried to raise reserve requirements and the uh, other dealers questioned the wisdom of the Fed just giving the banks the money after they raised the requirement. They, should, they said they shouldn't do that. They should just let the uh, they should just let the banks put up the put up the money they have, and that would bring the money supply down, and whatever. And I was going, no, that's not possible. If you look at the accounting, it doesn't work that way. Uh, again, the money has to come from the government. And at the time, uh, one of my colleagues went to Morgan Stanley, who was a major firm, with my point that they had had wrong. In fact, they had published it in the Wall Street Journal, and, and they um, retracted their statement. And agreed that the Federal Reserve would have to uh, would, would, would add the reserves when they raise the reserve requirements. So that wasn't MMT, but it was the beginnings of and a look back of where my interests were and understanding exactly how the money worked and how how the checks cleared. And in 1992, I was working uh, in an investment company I started in 1982, and Italian bonds were. Uh, very uh, inexpensive to the point where you could borrow lira to pay pay for them at 10 percent and the bonds would pay 12 percent so you could borrow at 10 and earn 12 you could make two percent for doing nothing except everyone was afraid that the uh, italian government would default and that you'd buy the bonds and they wouldn't pay and then you're just stuck with the money you borrowed you have to pay it back and you take massive losses so so nobody would do that and and so that caused me to look more deeply into that as to like if I, if I could come up with, a, with an understanding of why they went to fault, then that would be a safe trade to make. It would be safe to buy Italian bonds, which was also good for Italy. They were trying to get people to buy the bonds. Uh, and so I was, um, and, and that's when I came up with what became MMT within a, a year. And that is that the reason they will always pay their lira is because they have to spend first before they can collect the lira. And they've already been doing that. And I had some clients at uh, Harvard Management at the time. And they said, well, that's good, but let's make sure they know how to do it. So the, they set up a trip to Italy. We went to Rome and talked to people from the finance ministry, Professor Luigi Scavena, and had a strong discussion with him. And he, the, it was all doom and gloom there. The place was like a, like a morgue. They all thought they were going to default. They had documents from economists all over the world on their desk explaining why they were going to default. When I said this to him, the lights just came on and he looked up and he went into a rave against the IMF for austerity programs. And uh, we, he started calling in his colleagues from the other rooms at the treasury to, to hear this. And uh, they're making cappuccino for us to keep us there. We, we, we had a 20 minute meeting and two hours later we had to leave and it was a party. I mean, they were celebrating and within a week uh, they were made a statement that said, uh, no extraordinary measures will be taken. All payments will be met. And the, and the crisis just melted away because it was never there. And so that, that understanding of um, that the government with its own currency isn't constrained by its revenues. It's not constrained by what comes in in taxes because it's spending first and then taxes are being paid. So you don't have to worry about them not being able to make payments. Now, they might not have the willingness to make a payment. In 1943, the Japanese government owed the United States yen and didn't pay it. Well, that's a different matter. They had the yen to pay. They just didn't pay it. So there's willingness and there's ability. And, and my point was they always had the ability to pay. 
maybe not the willingness. And so um, at that point in time, Ross Perot was making enormous inroads uh, based on his anti-deficit stance. And he wound up getting, I don't know, 18 to 20 percent of the vote or something as a third party uh, being against the deficit, how the U.S. was facing default and uh, we're leaving this debt to our grandchildren and the whole thing. And so that was part of my motivation to try and get the word out that that's complete nonsense. And it's taken 30 years. <laughs> what can I tell you? Either I'm not very good at doing this or it's just a tough thing to get across. See? Okay, yeah. So I had a quick question regarding yeah, yeah. Uh, your proposal for zero rate policy. Yes, so, yes. firstly, how would you respond to those that say that uh, pursuing such a policy would be detrimental to uh, savers and pensioners because it would suppress bond yields and yeah, also yeah. those that believe it would incentivize companies taking on more debt than they need to? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's look at two things. You said it would suppress bond yields. Okay, so when I look at the base case for analysis, it's a zero rate policy. So my my model starts with a zero rate policy, and then you have got to give me a good reason to raise rates. And in a zero rate policy, uh, bonds are already at zero. And so what we've done is raise rates above that. We're back to zero now, but that, from time to time. And we threaten to raise rates if there's inflation. And so bonds are trading you know, above zero for that reason. So it's, it's not going to a zero rate doesn't depress bonds. So um, supporting a positive rate supports bonds at a higher than other level than otherwise. So the, to the extent that you could say the natural rate of interest is zero because if the government deficit spends, spends money and then only taxes part of it and leaves the rest in the savings account, the interest rate that's even in the term structure of rates will be at zero for risk-free rates for policy. Rate, unless the government takes action to push those rates up higher. And that's what treasury securities do. They function to support higher rates. That's the purpose, the monetary purpose behind them. And that's what paying interest on reserves does, which the Fed does when it wants to support a higher rate. It has to pay interest on reserves. So the government has to take positive action to keep rates high. And in the absence of government interference, government action, rates fall to zero. And so Japan's had zero rates for 30 years, and it hasn't been through any uh, strenuous action to keep rates down is because they're not taking action to push them higher. Okay, so that I answered the second part of your question first. Could you give me the first part again? I'm sorry. Yeah, and then the other part was uh, about incentivizing, uh, I guess that kind of oh, thing. Save it, save it, save it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the question is why do you want savers to earn interest? Now, I have this book out that you can get free online, take an hour and read it, called The Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds. And the reason people think savings is good is because they think you need save savings to be able to have investment, that savings funds investment. Well, that's completely backwards, and I make that up. That's been known for four or 500 years. It's called underconsumption theory. Uh, and it, it was the basis for Keynes's inspiration. So it's not certainly not a new thing. But the savings is the accounting record of investment. Investment causes savings. It's not the other way around. So if there's savings out there, it came from somebody's active investment. And uh, whether it's somebody spent more than their income, that's what we mean by investment. Somebody was deficit spending to build a factory. The government was spending more than its revenue. Somebody's out there spending more than uh, their income, just for lack of a better word. Uh, and that's where the savings comes from. They say it this way, the causation runs from investment to savings. It runs from loans to deposits. It doesn't go the other way. Banks don't take in deposits and make loans. They make loans which create the deposit. Uh, companies don't, people don't save, which creates money for investment. Companies invest and that creates the savings. And that's a just an accounting identity. It's a matter of accounting. It's a totality. Yeah, there's, there, yeah, there's absolutely no dispute. Uh, to that, yet it's entirely misunderstood. And out of that comes all these government incentives to try and help people save because they think they need the money for investment. So we get this massive um, uh, pools of funds going into pension funds and other places because they you get tax advantages when you put your money in your pension fund. It's all pre-tax money, pre-tax money in your IRA, 
all the money it earns doesn't pay taxes until you take it out. So there's these huge incentives to have this, which forces massive deficit spending, either private or public, in order to fund those vehicles. And, and so, again, it's another thing that the, the dialogue that's backwards in the dialogue, even though I wouldn't say mainstream economists have it backwards, it's hidden in their textbook somewhere. And that is um, that we need savings to have money for investment. So once you know that, you say, well, why do you want people to save? And the answer is, uh, well, so they can have money when they retire. And so they can live off their retirement. So seniors don't have to keep working till they drop dead. So they can have some date where they can. We think it's a civilized way to do things, to have people at age 65 receive an income. That's fine. And I, I agree. And that's called Social Security. So rather than you know, try and figure out ways for people to save more, uh, which creates, you know, uh, imperatives for deficits on the other side. Uh, I say just put Social Security at a living wage, raise the minimum to $2,000 a month or something like that. And uh, there's no moral hazard or anything else. And um, don't worry about the savings. Nobody has to save or they're going to be left out. Excuse me just a minute. Also, see, watch out for the echo. I think. I just lost the page. Wait a second. You're good. It's gonna be the little. It's gonna be the yeah. duck. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. It's gonna be the duck. So if you lose it again. No problem. No problem. Um, I think Tanish next, or if I see wants to follow up, it's fine. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I, com I completely forgot about the. Investment and saving causality running the opposite way from was traditionally thought, but then uh, So would you say then the solution you think would just be to increase uh, the amount for Social Security? Yes, and, and eliminate all those uh, savings incentives which would Start reducing the growth of it maybe eliminate all those massive pools of money I think it's 60 trillion dollars that's sloshing around in the hands of managers. It's causing uh you know, serious issues uh, for everybody uh, as, you know, when they play these financial games. The financial sector, which I, my tagline used to be, the financial sector is a lot more trouble than it's worth. And it's contributing uh, materially to this, uh, to the distribution of income issues. People managing these monies, the head funds preying off the managers of the, all these pension funds, teachers' retirement funds, all these other things. It's like uh, they're all they're like whales with all these sharks feeding off of them. And it's um, tying up real resources. These people doing these jobs in the hedge funds and the uh, investors who are taking advantage of them are uh, disproportionately smart people that could be curing cancer or coming up with you know, vaccines or whatever else we need to do. They can be coming up with uh, energy solutions and you know, you, you name it, all, all this knowledge that we need to address our real problems. Uh, these are the people we want doing it. We don't want them uh, buying and selling securities all day long. And, and we've got some of our best mathematicians doing algorithms on volatility surfaces for fixed income securities. It's like it's a massive waste of human endeavor. And, it's, and it hires off the top. They can afford to pay the most to get the best people. So we've got the brightest and the best minds being squandered in this financial sector that's, you know, where half of them are digging. Well, and they're, they're making massive amounts of money, right, which causes this whole distribution of income. Thing. If you eliminate these savings incentives, eliminate uh, the, the bond market by having a permanent zero rate policy, you'll still have the old bonds out there, but they'll become boring and nobody will want to work with them anymore. So you eliminate all the... Um, you know what's been feeding the financial sector. You got to cut it, cut off its uh, its its food at source, and and the ways you do that are eliminating these savings incentives and uh, having a zero permanent zero rate policy. Now, let me say one more thing about interest rates. When when the government raises rates, it's now paying interest, and so government spending is going up. All else equals, government deficit spending is going up, which is okay. It's not going to bounce checks, but who's the money going to? It's going to people who already have money, people who have uh, money in a bank, people who have treasury securities. And so what I call this basic income for people who already have money. It's basic income because if you make the interest rate 5%, you're giving all these people 5% for doing nothing. 
except for having money. So it's a form of basic income, but only for people who already have money. Now, with all the, I've heard a lot of people proposing basic income, and but I've never heard anyone propose basic income, but only for people who already have money. Okay, there's no political constituency for that. Yet that's what we're doing. So we've got the effect backwards, and because of that, we wind up giving basic income by the it would have been 500 billion this year if the Fed hadn't cut rates to people who already have money and making, again, making this uh, income distribution issue uh, much more severe. Teddy, or I think it's, or, yeah, Teddy. Um, okay, so uh, I just wanted to uh, continue on interest rates. So like uh, mainstream economics would suggest that like central banks lowering interest rate will stimulate economic growth, enhance demand, um, generate investment. But there are a lot of examples where the Federal Reserve has done this, uh, lowered the federal funds rate. And, you know, there has not been that following economic growth. So like during the Great Depression uh, Recession, for example, where the federal funds rate was held near zero. So essentially, what would MMT suggest that the mainstream misses with regards to like interest rates and uh, following growth? Yeah, well, one thing they don't focus on is the interest, what I call the interest income channels. When they cut rates from 5% to zero, it reduced government spending on interest by four or $500 billion a year. And that cut the, which is a cut in government spending. Now it was going to the wrong people to begin with. So but apart from that, it was going to somebody and it was contributing to the um, overall spending in the economy. And when spending slows down, that's, that's what recession is. The only measurement they have is spending. GDP is spending, which is also income. It's the same number. One person spends, another one receives. So uh, that, that's, that's all GDP is. And I, I said that in 2008. You can go back and look at my post. They're cutting rates. Uh, it's, going to, it's not going to fix anything. Japan's had zero rates for 30 years and, and hasn't uh, caused any kind of overheating or caused inflation or caused a, a buoyant economy. And uh, the Europeans have gone to negative rates on the euro, and that hasn't helped either. Uh, and so they've got all the evidence. You're exactly right about that. They say, well, their models are broken. Uh, and what their models are depending on are call, is called, i to get a little technical here, the propensities to spend uh, interest income. They think that the people who borrow are much more sensitive to interest rate changes than the people who save. So if interest rates go down, the people who borrow all of a sudden want to borrow more and, and uh, expand. And if interest rates go up, the people who borrow all of a sudden want to pull back. But they've had their own studies that show that these people, these investors who would be investing more if interest rates were down or interest rates were up, are not particularly sensitive to interest rates. The reasons they invest or don't invest, uh, interest rates are not high on that list. They're pretty far down, actually. They're, they don't make that big a difference to their investment decision. The larger issue is whether they can sell the product. If interest rates go up, but they can sell their products uh, and still make a profit, then they're going to invest. And when interest rates go up, the government's paying more money out, so people have more money to buy businesses' products. Now, again, the wrong people maybe have more money there. It's not a progressive way to do it, but in, you know, uh, but the macro economy has more money to uh, buy the products of business, and so investment doesn't go down; it goes up. Uh, you can. Uh, I remember just anecdotally back in the 1980s, I was uh, talking to a friend of mine in Australia, and I. And, uh, and he said, um, I asked him how the, the, the uh, housing market was. And he said, well, it's still pretty good. He said, interest rates are 17 and percent, which is high. He said, but the market's good. But if they push it up to 18, I think it's going to kill it. Okay. And then I get off the phone and I'm on a phone the next day to somebody in Japan. I say, how's the housing market? He said, well, it's terrible. You know, it's still flat. It's not, it's not good at all. Uh, interest rates are three and a half percent, but I think if they put it down to three, the market will get going. Okay, so that alone told me how important can interest rates be, right? And, and it's true; it's held out the entire time. And I said the same thing about Japan when they had zero rates back in the late '90s. And they're never going to get out of them because zero rates keep inflation low and they keep um, the economy weak in that. With zero rates, 
you have to have more deficit spending to have the same growth. Now, that's a good thing because it means you have to have more public services, more free education, more uh, federal infrastructure, or lower taxes to keep the economy going well. So if you recognize a deficit is just the money supply, it means the net money supply, it means you just have to have more in the money supply to have a good economy, which means lower taxes or more public spending. Well, to me, that's a good thing. It is to most people, but they didn't see it that way. And so they, Japan, every few years, they get scared about, you know, their public debt just terrifies them. It's 250% of GDP, and they'll raise consumption taxes or raise some tax, and then everything goes back down again, right? And, uh, and so for 30 years, they've been relatively stagnant. Although they have beautiful infrastructure and good education, and other things, you know, it's it's not it's not anywhere near what it could have been. Did, did I answer your question? If not, pin me down. It's okay. No question. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Tanish. So obviously, a lot of there's a lot of restraints in the world trying to stop uh, trying to stop us from fully embracing MMT, such as uh, the IMF and the World Bank because of the lack of monetary sovereignty that they give certain countries. So my question is, do you think that those could be reformed to, uh, I guess, push push better monetary sovereignty towards countries? Or do you think we would have to abolish yeah. them in order to... Uh, right. Well, I don't... Yeah, I don't use the word monetary sovereignty because no two people define it the same way. So I find it better just to say what you're saying. So do you mean push countries towards floating exchange rate from fixed exchange rate? You know, what, yeah, essentially. What exactly do you mean? Okay, well, I, well, for one thing, most of the countries have floating exchange rates. That, you know, Bulgaria doesn't. They're on a currency board with the euro, and they definitely should be off of it. I attended, a, a, I was at a rally in Sofia. I, I was at a conference. There was a rally going on, a big rally next door um, for, for free speech. Okay, all these people were rallying for free speech. And uh, I was with Pavlina Chernov, I don't know if you know her name, and she's Bulgarian, and, and a couple of other people, uh, Ryan Marco. And we made up some signs that said the currency board is killing the 1%, is killing the 99%. You know, and that the currency board was a made problem, which it is, because it's, you need a floating exchange rate to be able to pursue full employment policy. And that's why they, they were depressed. So we go out there with our signs written in Bulgaria. And at, to a free speech rally. And these people uh, sort of attacked us, grabbed the signs, tore them up, threw them on the ground, told us to leave and not come back. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Uh, so in that sense, it's a, you know, it's a major obstacle in Bulgaria, but it's not understood as an obstacle. And so they don't, there's no, doesn't seem to be any way to get past it. They, they seem to see it as a good thing, the same as the currency board in Hong Kong, but they're actually obstacles to their well-being. So it's, it's a challenge to, to uh, uh, for people to understand that a, a floating exchange rate like the U.S., like Europe, like, like the euro, like the, the, the pound and the yen is the way to go to sustain the full employment and prosperity in the country. And they just don't see it and, uh, and with a vengeance. So. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, it's gonna. It's a rough battle between. Um, uh, all, with all, it's a rough battle that all these countries, uh, you know, the upper half are pushing on to the lower half. But thank you, thank you for answering that. To yeah, Aiden. All right. Well, just to go back to uh, interest rates, uh, yes. could you run over the basic benefits of a zero interest rate policy? Yeah, so you're not paying basic income to all these people who already have money. And so that eliminates a lot of the in income distribution issue. And because you're not throwing this money at them to spend, uh, it means that the, the uh, the government has to spend it some other way. Let's say you, you, you want to run a certain size, uh, the right size deficit. And uh, and so you can spend it on your public infrastructure or your uh, health care, education, whatever, uh, you know, whatever uh, advances. It. For me, it's to advance the progressive agenda. Somebody else might want to spend it on nuclear weapons or something. I understand there's a political debate. Okay, so uh, 
it, it also um, is a deflationary policy. It's raising rates is inflationary. So why would you want to do something? Why would you support a higher rate policy to support inflation? I don't see the benefit in that. It's an extremely unpopular thing to do that. Uh, and again, it's my base case for analysis. The, the burden of proof is on you to tell me why I should why as a state, as a government, I should interfere with what will otherwise be a zero rate policy by selling securities, by establishing a bond market uh, that creates this uh, massive you know, element of the financial sector that, uh, that absorbs massive amounts of real resources that could be used other places that are desperately needed for you know, environment, shifting the whole, uh, uh, our whole economy away from uh, damaging the environment. Okay, why, why would I want to shift, have a brain drain from all these other sciences and areas into the financial sector? Uh, you, you've got the burden of proofs on you to tell me why I should raise rates. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I look at it that way. And when I say that to people, they can't come up with any reason for higher rates except to fight inflation. And once they realize that's not the case, then there is no reason for a positive rate policy. All right, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Mosley. Yeah, look, environmental degradation is, a, is is maybe our number one problem right now. And as soon as COVID hit, our uh, that our emissions dropped by like fifty percent overnight. All right, and now they've come back, and they dropped fifty percent overnight by eliminating non-essentials. Right. That is that's called conservation, right? So just through conservation. Uh, shock conservation, we dropped by 50%. We could not drop 50% with every Green New Deal program you can imagine, you know, for the next 30 years. Okay, and here it happened out of this, out of nowhere uh, because of COVID, and it was all non-essential. So I was saying from the beginning, okay, we want to restart the economy, but let's just, let's not add back any non-essentials that are going to contribute to environmental degradation. Well, here we are now, the economy is 90% back, and our levels of um, air pollution are back up to, you know, almost back to where they were before and, and everything else. And it's just such an opportunity squandered. Uh, and now it, and it just made the problem much worse than it was. We not only lost a year or more, but um, we're, now we've got to overcome this idea that somehow we Reducing environmental degradation, you know, cuts into our essentials for the standard of living and eliminates jobs and all these other things. And it's just really, a, you know, a disgrace, I'd say, to, to the economics profession that they let this happen without some kind of a uh, much stronger resistance to it. Okay, I got my pet peeve out of the way. I agree with you, uh, Mr. Mosley. Thanks for answering. Uh, Simone, and then I think we have a couple questions in chat, and then we're going to go, you know, a couple people have multiple questions, so we're just going to cycle through, you know, we're going person to person. So, Simone, if you have a question, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I know earlier I was talking about, like, the ethicality of, uh, like, post-Keynesian economics and stuff like that. And so I think about, I think uh, online, a lot of, like, Marxian people uh, critique these things by bringing up things like exploitation theory and then things like, um and wait exploitation theory and imperialism so how do you think that like post keynesian economics uh or like what's your response to these critiques or how do you think yeah. that they fight off by these things the, the you know a lot of the uh, mmt proponents at one time had been considered post keynesian but now they're considered mmt proponents and the post keynesians will largely reject have been rejecting me for a long time it's only been a handful that kind of left, jumped ship, and came across and started working on these things. And you know, I could name the originals. And now, of course, there are a lot more. So um, I've spoken with a lot of uh, Marxian economists, Bill Mitchell's Marxian economists. And uh, when I was in Italy, a uh, guy named uh, Professor Bill Fiore, Carl Bill Fiore. And what I've gathered, what I've learned is that Marx did not recognize that tax liabilities are the cause of unemployment. He didn't have the MMT money story. So this is probably a good time for me to give you the money story. It's, it's three or four points. So when these other um, schools of thought 
described, try and tell you what money is. First of all, if you look in their textbooks, they don't even know. They say, they tell you what it does. It's a store value. It's a medium of exchange, but they don't know what it actually is. MMT tells you exactly what it is. It's a tax credit. It's a thing that can be used to pay taxes. The dollar is a tax credit, U.S. government tax credit. Uh, so, and, and you'll hear stories about barter and it became more useful to go to currency. So there was some kind of a shift. And the archaeologists have never found that, by the way, but it doesn't matter to me anyway. So the way I tell the money story that is consistent with today's currencies and what's happening in today's economies is you begin with a government that wants to provision itself. We want collective action. We want public health. We want a justice, a legal system. We want a military. We want uh, resources uh, in the public sector that are now in the private sector. So how do we extract those resources from the private sector to the public sector. Now, there were times in history, maybe even today, where a country will attack another country, bring back slaves and force them to do the work. Okay, that's one way. The British used to uh, go to bars, find drunks, who would wake up the next day on a British ship as a sailor. You know, it's another way to get people to, into the public sector. Okay, we pretend to be more civilized. What we do is we impose a tax liability in, and just think, excuse me, of a property tax on your house to make the point here. Uh, it works for income taxes, but it's a lot more complicated. And I'm actually against those transactions taxes because they're, they turn out to be regressive on close examination. So let's just start with a property tax. You put a tax on everybody's house. And, and what does that do? Uh, and it's a tax in something that nobody has. You know, George Washington, the first day, says there's a tax in the new currency called the U.S. dollar, and every house has to pay $1,000 a month tax, or else we're going to burn your house down or sell your house at auction. We're going to sell your house at auction. So now you've created a population of people who need dollars to pay their taxes. And these people are out looking for work that pays in dollars. They can't afford to go work for something else unless they can sell it for dollars, but nobody has any. So somebody has to get a job that pays in dollars or and the dollars have to come from the government or else everybody's going to lose their house. So it creates sellers of goods and services, sellers, people looking to work in exchange for dollars. Now, people who are looking for paid work are what we call unemployed. Okay. The unemployed are not people looking to volunteer at the American Cancer Society or the Heart Association. The people who are looking for paid work, they want the money. Okay. And so unless there's a tax liability that demands that money, you're not going to get people working to earn that money. And so in the first instance, tax liabilities, now I didn't say tax payments, the tax liability, that's the thing they slap on your house, the tax that requirement, the tax requirements, it's called tax requirements, liabilities and requirements. Tax requirements come first. They create the sellers of goods and services. Now the government can create all the tax credits it wants. They're just you just add numbers to your account at the Federal Reserve Bank or they give you green pieces of paper. They've got all these people, millions of people looking to work to earn these tax credits so that they don't lose their house. So step two, the government hires the people it wants to provision itself, which was the original reason for the tax liabilities, for the tax requirement. Okay, so they slap on a tax requirement, creates people looking for work, they hire them. Now the government has its soldiers and it's public health workers and anybody else it wants. It's justices and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, teachers. And, um, and so, and then the government pays the people, it hires the people, it pays the people the dollars, and then they pay the tax. And that's the end of the chain. Okay. It ends with the payment of the tax. It doesn't begin with the payment of the tax. It ends with the payment of the tax. Okay. It's like a, it's like a ticket to the uh, Super Bowl. It begins with a stadium having a, a game that everybody wants. They then sell tickets to people who want to go. The people take those tickets and uh, maybe sell them to somebody else at a profit. Now, when that person goes to the game, he gives it to the guy at the door. He tears it up, and, and the ticket's finished. Why would he tear up a $5,000 ticket? Because it's used up. It's done. Okay. And if you pay your taxes with actual cash, Let's say you were a waiter and you've got $20 bills. Bill, thank you for helping to pay for Afghanistan. Give you a receipt. And then as soon as you leave the room, they send it off to the shredder. You can buy the shredded money in Washington. So look, everybody knows 
the football stadium doesn't collect the ticket first and then sell it. They sell the ticket first and then collect it. Okay. And the U.S. government does the same thing. The dollar is their tickets. They don't collect the dollars first. They can't. Any more than the football stadium can collect their tickets. They have to sell the dollars first, exchange them for goods and services, and then, uh, then they get paid. Then they collect it afterwards. And people won't uh, go to work for the government because there's something they want from the government. This is like a get out of jail free card. The government says you owe us a tax liability. It's like a negative. It's like a big negative uh, coercive benefit. If you don't pay, we're going to sell your house. Okay, so it's it's a violent system, and the state has to monopoly on violence. And this is how it starts. Okay, so that's how the money story works. And so there's a there's a tax requirement. All these people are now out of work. The state hires half of them, half the people. And it leaves the rest to be unemployed. They became un they all became unemployed because of the tax requirements. The state didn't hire all the people that it created, that its tax requirement created to be, you know, caused to be unemployed. And so that's why we have residual unemployment. All the unemployed we have now is because the state hasn't spent enough money for people to pay the tax requirements and to save the amount they desire to save. People want, want to work their own population can only do two things with the dollars. They can either pay taxes or not pay taxes. If you earn them and don't pay taxes, it means somebody's saving them that day. They stay out there as savings, and usually in savings accounts that we call treasury securities, but they, to circle back to how I started, but the money's out there in savings accounts, and that's the money, the net money supply in the account. Okay, so unemployment is caused by government tax liabilities, by taxation, by design to get people to be unemployed so they can spend their otherwise worthless currency to get them to work for the government. So why would a government create, you know, 20 million of unemployed and only hire 5 million? It doesn't make any sense at all. It's because they've got the story backwards. Once they understood the money story, they wouldn't do that. If they did it, they'd realize they made a mistake. And so the responsibility for, for unemployment is necessarily the government. It's in the hands of the government. It's not the fault of the unemployed. Okay, instead we blame the victims. And say, well, you know, if you worked hard and studied and college graduates are getting jobs and if you went to college, you get a job. It's not true. You know, we, I tell the story about the dogs and the bones. Have you heard that story? You, you send 100 dogs into a room where there's only 95 bones and five of them don't come back with a bone. And so uh, the sociologists and the you know, microeconomists, they all examine the five dogs that didn't get bones. And they find out they're not as fast and they don't cooperate and they don't bite as hard. So they have training programs. They train all those dogs to really be good bone getters. Then they run the experiment again. They send the 100 dogs back into the room. And sure enough, their five dogs come back with a bone. Well, yeah, but now there's five other dogs that don't have a bone because you've got a macro problem. Okay, And the macro problem is the tax has created more unemployment than the government wants to hire. And you can play musical chairs and training and whatnot, but it doesn't lower the actual rate of unemployment because it's a macro problem. And once you understand that, the, your, all your policy choices are different. And you, you recognize immediately what you have to do to, to make it right, to amend this tragic error, this crime against humanity of creating more unemployed than you need and then just leaving them out there to rot. So you say, okay, I need to get these people. I don't want them in the government. The government's fully provisioned. We have all the teachers we want. We have all the workers for the Green New Deal we want. They're still unemployed. Okay, it's my mistake. My tax liability was too high. Uh, how do I get them back in the pri private sector? Okay, so you can lower taxes or increase public spending so that private sector has more money to, and will uh, grow and, and um, invest and, the, and will hire more people and these people will get hired. And that's true. But the unemployed, as soon as the government unemploys them, unfortunately become damaged goods because they're not working. And the people in the private sector, and I've been in the private sector for a long time now, don't want to hire people who aren't working. It's too risky. They might be on drugs. They might not come in on time. They might get in fights. They might not be clean. You know, it just, it's just too many things that can happen that you can't get out of an interview. You're better off hiring somebody already working where the supervisor says, this guy's good. He's been coming in on time. And you get a little bit of a reference. Okay. So how do we get these people that we cause to be unemployed, that we don't want to put in government because we already have everybody we want. How do we get them back in the private sector? We put them in this job guarantee. 
Okay, by having a job for everybody who willing and able to work, they now have a place they go every day, they have a track record, they have a supervisor who can vouch for them. These people can now transition into the private sector much more easily than otherwise uh, if they were left unemployed. And the evidence is the pool of unemployed keeps getting larger and larger. And the long-term unemployed almost never get back into the labor force because business doesn't want to hire them. But once they've been working in a government job guarantee program, no matter what it is, just having a track record, coming in on time, being reliable, they get work in the other economy. And we uh, uh, demonstrated this back in 2001 in Argentina, the Jefe de Jugar program, Daniel Kosar, the, um, was with the um, labor ministry down there, had read my paper, Full Employment Price Stability, about how this job guarantee would work. And as soon as they floated the peso, he implemented it. A guaranteed job for every head of household who wanted one. And there were, were on a population of 35 million, something like 2 million people entered this program over the next few years. And out of that two, and not, none of them had ever worked in the private sector. No one ever expected them to. They were considered disadvantaged. They were Indians, and whatever they considered disadvantaged down in Argentina. Within two years, a million of them had transitioned into private sector jobs. The insurance companies would hire them to work in their cafeterias or whatever. As long as they were coming in on time, had a track record, you know, were presentable, they got hired. Okay. And so um, I, I think, am I going too long to answer this question? No. Um, okay. Okay. I don't want to use no. up all your time if, if I'm off point. No, no, we got, we got. Okay. So, time. so, so the, if you talk about post Keynesians, they don't have that money story. They don't recognize the uh, unemployed is are there by design by government. So you don't get that ethical responsibility to undo this horror that you created. But MMT see, you know, hits you straight between the eyes with that. You've created government. You've created this horror. This is a crime against humanity, particularly if you know about it and don't do anything about it. And so all these um, are the idea that you have to balance your uh, budget across the cycle, like uh, I believe a lot of post Keynesians used to think, uh, where you don't. It's just the money supply. It's not a problem. Uh, so I think this goes, if you, if you like post Keynesianism for the ethical imperatives, I think this goes two or three steps further just from knowledge. Without a single, what I call, bleeding heart argument, you can make the compelling cases for a, a complete progressive agenda. And not that I have any problem with the bleeding heart arguments. Mine, I feel it as much or more than anybody. That's why I'm doing it. But there are a lot of people that don't. And I'd like to see this agenda implemented. I'd like to see Medicare for all. And so I want arguments that prevail against everybody. And, uh, and these MMT arguments prevail against everybody. They don't rely on arguments, that, on subjective arguments. They're objective arguments. And they accomplish everything that, uh, is, that a lot of people have been trying to accomplish using subjective arguments. Awesome. Um, I think I did have one question from the chat. Um, I think there was one from a bit ago. Um, it says, and it'll just come on the screen. It says, what are your thoughts on Paley's critique on MMT using high power money interests and his baseline to go off of back in January 2013? Uh, you know, I haven't read it, but I've known, okay. Tom, for, I've known Tom for a long time. And um, I, I'll just say it publicly. I just think he's intellectually dishonest. But if you give me something specific, I'll, I'll give you the response. But he knows that response and he just leaves it out. So, I, you know, and he's he's been an obstacle I've, uh, to, to us. I'm not sure why. I don't know that anybody's paying him to do it. I don't know what it is. He sees it as something he has to do to make a living. I really don't know. It just comes out of nowhere. And when I speak to him personally, he understands exactly what I'm saying. And then this stuff comes out in left field. And, you know, he gets a lot of attention. And uh, maybe he gets paid for it. I don't know. Um. So give me a specific. Give me a specific. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm looking. I'll look for um. Oh. The, uh, this is from a commenter. That's why um I don't really have it, but I'll yeah. I'll see if he if they give a specific. Um, 
Yeah. Um, Nick, you want to go back? Um, Nick yeah. wants to come again, and then I think I have. There's another one, but I want Nick to speak. Yeah, there, there's a question that I thought was that I found interesting reading in your book. Uh, it says, "Can Mister Mosler explain again why he believes importation is better for an economy than exportation? A trade deficit is like a good thing." Well, that's what the question was. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of levels to look at. It. So I'll start with the uh, common sense level. And I like to say economics is the opposite of religion. It's better to receive than to give. Right? So, uh, it, it, so if exports are so good, as most of the world thinks, and IMF has pushed export-driven growth and everything else, let's take it to the extreme. Let's say you export everything and don't import anything. That means everything you make goes to somebody else, and you get a bunch of money in somebody's bank account somewhere. Uh, but you don't import anything. Well, what happens to your population? Like everybody dies. All your food is gone. Everything you produced is gone. You, you have nothing. And that's the that's if you export everything. So obviously, if that's not like a good public policy. <laughs> the other thing is, let's say you import everything and don't export anything. Somehow you manage to import everything. What happens? Everybody has everything they need, full, everything they could want, everything they can imagine. They don't have to work. I don't know. That doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> That sounds like a pretty good deal if you could get away with it, all right? And so when I talk to economists about this, they say, well, yeah, that's the key. Yes, imports are the benefits and exports are the costs. And it's better to import you know, than to export if you can get away with it. I say, fine. But first, you have to understand what you're doing and why. So the object, so you, what I tell them to do is look at what your real wealth is as a country. I say, think of your real wealth as a pile of stuff. So your pile of stuff, how big a pile do you have? Well, what's in the pile? Everything that you produce domestically is your pile of stuff for the country. Every car you produce, every medical service, every, every uh, child you educate, that's your pile of stuff that you've accomplished, that you have. That's your real wealth uh, that you create. Everything you import makes your pile bigger. And everything you export makes your pile smaller. So to optimize your real wealth, if that's important, you want to make your pile as large as possible. So you want to import as much as possible and export as little. Said another way, you want to get the most for your exports. So if you can export, you know, one Ferrari to Berlin and get four Mercedes, that's good. If you can export one Ferrari and get five Mercedes, that's better. Okay, those are called real terms of trade. So that's the way to look at these fundamentals. And so uh, when they say uh, the United States has a large trade deficit, six or seven, maybe pushing 700 billion this year, that means our pile of stuff is getting larger from imports, smaller from exports. Our exports are still huge, but they're not as large. And our pile of stuff has grown, is $700 billion larger this year than it would have been without that trade deficit without those net imports. And so it's it's an enormous benefit to us to be able to do that, for people to sell us these products. And all they want to do is save our money. And what do they want to save it for? I don't know. You know, Mostly to buy our imports, but not right away, maybe next year or the year after, because our imports grow as our, um, as we import more, our exports grow, but there's a lag. Because we import more, we pay everybody dollars, and then sooner or later they come back and buy things. So there's a lag, but the growth rates of our imports and exports are usually pretty close over longer periods of time. So we have what I call import-led growth. I, I don't see a problem with that. Now, the problem comes up if you don't understand the finance behind it, and you come up with a money story and a finance story that looks like a disaster, like, oh, the foreigners are financing our spending habits, and uh, someday we're going to have to pay the pipe or something like that. But if you look at the debits and credits and who's borrowing what from whom, it, it, that's not true at all. Okay, it's just some narrative somebody made up that sounds good, you know, it's on the surface. But when you look into it, it's, it's, it's not correct at all. And if it was going to be a problem, um, you know, we wouldn't be running these massive deficits for this long a period of time. One of those awful things would have happened, and that's true of the UK and Australia. And there's a lot of other countries that run continuous trade deficits now. One of the reasons you can do that in today's world is that JP Morgan has a currency index based on you know, population, I think. And so they, um, 
the dollars in there and the Australian dollars in there, the US dollar, the British pound and the yen. Most of the currencies in the world are in there, that index. And investors who like to diversify because they read a paper somewhere saying they should diversify, they want to save that percentage of all of the currency. So if the US dollar is 20%, they want 20% of their savings in US dollars. The Australian dollar is 3%, they want 3% Australian dollars and so on. And so that creates savers, accumulators of money. And the only way that country can get that money to save is to export to the US, to Australia, to the UK. And so uh, things like, again, we get back to the financial sector and its um, imperatives behind its investment that are creating a lot of things that I would say uh, don't promote public policy, don't promote public purpose the way I see public purpose. And so I have proposals to address all those things so that they do promote public purpose. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mosler. So this yeah. is something that a few people brought up in the chat, and I'm just going to reword their question a little bit. Uh, what are your th uh, What are your thoughts on uh, the business cycle theory specifically? Uh, obviously, you had Min Minty's instability hypothesis, but uh, chat wants to know what your thoughts are on the Austrian business cycle theory specifically. So if you could expand okay. on that, and then what you actually yeah. believe in the business cycle theory as well. Yeah. So the uh, first, the Austrian that applies to fixed exchange rates where you have a gold standard or Bulgaria is fixed to the euro or Hong Kong is fixed to the US dollar. So for those three economies, Austrian is, the economics is probably okay. I mean, that, that's where it would apply. I haven't looked at them to see, tested to see if it, how well it holds there, but I would expect it to hold there. But it's not applicable at all to floating exchange rates because in the Austrian model of fixed exchange rate, the interest rates are determined by the market, market forces. And if you try and move to other interest rates, you get uh, suboptimal uh, investment decisions because you're not going by these market signals. So um, to the extent that that's valid, it's valid in a fixed exchange rate, gold standard economy. But it's just not applicable at all. It's like watching a different movie channel. Uh, it's not applicable at all to floating exchange rates where the currency is not convertible. And therefore, the central bank sets the rate. Therefore, zero is the natural rate. Uh, in the absence of government interference. With fixed exchange rate, in the absence of government interference, the interest rate uh, goes to where the market sets it as the market players compete for the reserves. But it's just, again, not applicable to floating exchange rate. Now, in terms of Minsky, I, I've never read Minsky. And I, you know, I can't say I've, you know, I, I use anything from Minsky. And, you know, I'll use an expression occasionally that's probably from Minsky, but I'm, I don't use any of his analysis for anything. So if you have a specific question about the business cycle, I can answer that. Uh, not necessarily. It was more like, how do you uh, how do you personally like view the business cycle and how it works, I guess? Oh, so yeah. Like so look, the way the business cycle has worked in the past with floating exchange rates, broadly speaking, is we have a um, counter-cyclical tax structure. As the economy goes better, tax liabilities, tax requirements go up. People get into higher tax brackets, they get more income, their tax rates go up. Property values increase, more property taxes paid. And businesses make more profits, more corporate taxes paid. So as the economies get stronger, taxes go up and that tends to drive the budget deficit lower. So in 2006, the budget deficit got down to 1% of GDP. Uh, and th that, it, it would just keep going lower if the economy kept growing until it gets to the point where it's too low to support the economy. It's the money supply. The money supply is not enough for the state of the economy at that point in time, for the state of credit expansion and, and whatnot. And then you get an accident like Lehman and the private sector credit expansion disappears. The government doesn't understand its role to uh, spend more than its income to cut taxes or increase public spending, um, like the payroll tax holiday I proposed in 2008. And so the economy contracts, okay? And it takes, to offset all the savings desires in the economy, it takes an increasing amount of deficit spending, somebody spending more than their income, to offset all the people spending less than their income. And if it's not the government doing it, it has to be the private sector. So in 2005 and six, you had the private sector doing it in the mortgage market. In 2000, um, 
1999, 98, 99, and into 2000, you had the private sector ex, uh, credit expansion expanding through dot-com businesses, uh, getting funded, and uh, Y2K investment funding, and real estate boom, mortgage markets. And so they, the government was able to, you know, uh, tax the tax payments went up so quickly that the government went into surplus. And so, uh, but the total deficit spending was enough to sustain the economy. Uh, as soon as that private sector deficit spending stopped, the government had already stopped, was in surplus, the whole thing collapsed. The same thing happened in 07, 08. Uh, the government deficit spending had dropped to 1% of GDP. So as soon as private sector deficit spending stopped because of Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, and the gov then the whole thing collapsed because the government wasn't there to uh, offset the savings with its own deficit spending. Now, today, it didn't happen that way. We just had private sector deficit spending collapse, credit. People buying things on credit collapsed a year ago with COVID. You can see the numbers here. Large large drops in borrowing from banks, borrowing on credit cards and whatnot. But the government came in and spent more than its income, gave everybody checks and unemployment compensation and whatnot. And that enabled the economy to sustain spending, not at previous levels, but at pretty decent levels to where it wasn't this kind of collapse that we had in 2008 and in 2000. And so once government understands the, the, the simple, you know, it's a simple, it's a simple matter of just standing by to either lower taxes or increase public spending in response to a drop in private sector deficit spending. Then there's no particular reason for the thing to end. Okay, in terms, at least in nominal terms. Now, if you have a food supply or an energy crisis, or um, you know, the, the temperature gets too high and you know all the food disappears. You can avoid a financial crisis, but you're still going to starve to death. Okay, so, uh, but in terms of a financial crisis, it's does it's there's a chance that they do understand it now, and it's not going to happen again. If it does, it'll be very brief again because they know how to offset it. You just cut taxes or increase public spending. Now there are big arguments over whose taxes to cut and where to spend the money, but uh, again, hopefully it's brief and they can sustain you know, the economy, the financial aspects of the economy. Yeah. Um, let's see if uh, Teddy or C wants to go. Uh, or let's start. Yeah. With yeah. So, um, so I have a quick question regarding inflation. So, yeah. yeah. Through like post Keynesian price theory, which I believe is pretty well borne out in the empirical data, we see that like companies really only increase prices when there's an increase in factor inputs or cost of labor. And this connects back to the MMT view in that. Inflation is primarily uh, only apparent when demand outstrips supply and uh, resources begin to increase in price due to the fact that they're all being used. And okay, that's, really, not, that's not the MMT view, but go ahead. Yeah, not, okay, I believe I read that in one of Bill Mitchell's articles, so if you could uh, yeah, clarify yeah. that. Okay, well, whatever. I'll tell you what right. it is. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and, uh, so then my question would then be that uh, I know then that I've at least uh, read from the likes of Bill Mitchell that the primary issue would be once the real resource constraint. Once uh, real resources are used, inflation ensues. Uh, how would that, what would then be the M2 response to this inflation? And uh, yeah. Okay. So um, yes, excess aggregate demand can cause inflation. It's one way you can get prices to go up, but that alone can't do it. But that that given institutional structure our current institutional structure of how government spends and how most governments spend, excess aggregate demand can cause inflation. But what I like to say is I've been around watching these markets since 1972, I think, or three. I have never seen an inflation caused by excess demand. Yes, it can happen, and we're always watching for it, but it's usually caused by something else. It's usually something on the cost side. Uh, for example, the oil crisis, the Saudis became the monopoly uh, supplier at the margin of oil. So they were price setters. So they decided to raise the price from $3 to $40 over a period of eight years or whatever. And those costs got passed through on the cost side and drove the inflation of that period of time, which is why we're still hypersensitive to 
and that was not understood as the cause at the time. And the increase in interest rates was understood as a reason that ended. That wasn't at all. That just prolonged it. That's why it took another 10 years for inflation to come down because the high rates were prolonging it. Inflation came down because the price of oil broke for several reasons. There was a recession caused by uh, fiscal policy where the inflation adjusted budget deficit, uh, public debt actually fell. So it was like a surplus and uh, caused a big collapse in 1979, 1980. And that, uh, the demand for oil drop, but also uh, Jimmy Carter deregulated natural gas, for example, in 1978, which allowed public utilities, which were burning oil, to shift to natural gas, which took a long period of time, but it gave them the uh, the uh, ability to do that. While the price had been capped and supply was not available, they couldn't even begin to contract it that way. So we had uh, lots of, uh, we had deregulation in the energy sector and we had a collapse in demand from the uh, recession and global recession and the higher prices brought out you know, more investment and more supply. So you had all those things going, but the high rates caused you know, the price of oil dropped in 1980, 81, 82 from 40 to 10 or something like that. And, you know, the, the uh, inflation continued for, for another eight or 10 years. It was still at 12% and only came down slowly. And that's because they thought they had to keep interest rates up high to uh, keep the inflation from coming back. And all they were doing was prolonging it. But again, that's that's my story. I'm sticking to it. It was a long time ago. Uh, so MMT has the only understanding of the source of the price level of any of the current schools of economic thought. And that is the currency is a simple public monopoly. Like I said, government imposes a tax requirement and then it alone through its agents, which includes commercial banks, but the government agents, uh, spends those tax credits, the dollars that can be used to pay the taxes. And when you have a single supplier, like your microeconomics tells you about monopoly in the first 15 minutes, it's very simple. The supplier is price center. There's no market forces. There's, not, there's no way, nothing that the uh, price center, the monopolist can do except pick a price. If you have all the electricity for this, for the municipality that you're at, and there are no alternative sources and you have an electric company, you set the price, 10 cents a kilowatt, 15 cents. You might have reasons for setting it, but there's no market price where you have lots of sellers and lots of buyers and they get together at indifference levels. So that, that comes from multiple suppliers, not with single suppliers. That's monopoly. It's the easiest thing to learn in micro. The second easiest is oligopoly, which is a few suppliers. And then after that, you get more and more competitive, and that takes the rest of your career to try and figure out. Uh, how perfect competition works with asymptotes, math, and all that stuff. Okay, but monopoly, you don't need any of that. And so the, the price level is necessarily and entirely a function of prices paid by the government and its agents when it spends. Uh, and it does this through its own institutional structure. It, it's got its own things that happen automatically, like who gets a pay raise if the price of this or that changes. Those are all government uh, established institutional structures. Those are all uh, part of this monopolist setting price. So if demand picks up for whatever reason, private sector, people decide to spend their savings, uh, the foreign foreigners decide to spend all the import, you know, uh, from the U S to, you know, buy our exports go up. We have huge jump in demand. The price level will not go up unless the government pays the higher prices when it spends. Now, let me give you, you know, it might go up for a short period, in a very short run, but over certainly medium term or the near, near term, maybe, maybe a year or two, it, the prices will come back down. And here's why. So let's say our government this year is going to spend $5 trillion and suddenly prices go up. And it says, you know what? We're not going to pay a penny more than what we paid last year for any of this. What happens to government spending? It goes to zero. It says, you know, prices are up. We're not going to pay it. Okay, well, with a drop of $5 trillion of government spending, you've got a massive shortage of dollars. Tax credits need to pay taxes in the economy. You've got a massive deflationary event where suddenly these sellers have nobody to sell to. It's, it's not enough that there's been this internal demand. The government draining $5 trillion a year. You know, people have to pay taxes, but they're not getting any government spending. There's water going down the drain, but there's no water coming in. Uh, you know, fairly quickly, I would say, 
uh, prices come down to where the government is able to buy what it wants to. And it's a pretty big disaster as it, you know, at the same time. It's not good policy to do that. I'm not at all saying it's good policy. I'm saying, I'm just saying to make the point that it's only when the government pays the higher prices that then they be, that becomes a new price level. And the government has that option. And because of its own institutional structure, it's not a viable, particularly viable tool to use. But they use it around the edges quite a bit. When they set prices for Medicare or whatnot, when they stop paying extra, prices come down. Okay, if the, if the government's a large buyer and uh, oh, you look at military contracting, when they revise the way they, uh, they procure military equipment to make it more competitive, for example, prices come down. Okay, so, um, and it's, you could say it's a monopsony, I, I call it monopsony. You're the single um, supplier of the things in, uh, of what's needed to pay taxes through their spending. So in that sense, they're the single payer of, of those. Uh, and so uh, Bill, Bill is not wrong. Bill, will, Bill entirely acknowledges that. And he qualifies what he says with, with that uh, in mind at least every time I've heard him or spoken with him. And, um, but a lot of the MMT proponents don't. And, uh, and I think some of them have written quite a bit on alternatives to uh, lowering demand to constrain prices when prices are going up for other reasons. Uh, but even those things I've read have not given the full emphasis to the idea they haven't began with the idea that currency is a monopoly, that state is a single supplier, it's price setter, end of story. No, everything else fits into that understanding precisely. And there's no other school of thought that has any understanding of the, where the price level comes from. They all use expectations theory, which is left over from money supply theory, which didn't work, you know, and a couple of other theories they have that didn't work. They had three or four, the, the last one, expectations, is all they have left. So by default, they're saying that's what it is. So they'll tell you that expectations can move prices from where they are today to tomorrow. They'll tell you today's price level came from yesterday's price level, you know, altered by expectations. But they, they can't tell you where the price level comes from except yesterday's price level. It's a his, it's historically determined. I mean, there is no such thing. Okay, that's that's an infinite regression. That's their models don't work because of that. And that's why they're so weak on inflation. Because, you know, they got it wrong. They don't understand the currency as a monopoly. Once you understand that, then you're, they're, if they could model the currency as a monopoly in their models, then they would work properly. But they have yet to do that. And I've suggested it to a lot of them. They don't entirely disagree. They just don't do it. Nick, you had a question? Wait, could I follow up for a little bit? Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Steve's going to follow up first, and then Nick, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I, I should have, my apologies, I should have clarified it because my question wasn't really re with regards to uh, traditionally what caused inflation because I agree with you that primarily on the cost per side, it was more so because uh, I remember now the context in which uh, Bill Mitchell was writing about it was with regards to what uh, people arguing against the job guarantee say that uh, at the point that we give all these people uh, jobs and try to push unemployment closer to zero, we'll see an overwhelming increase in demand and then that's when we'll start seeing those uh, inflationary uh, effects from the demand side. So how do you respond to those uh, well, critiques brought up against the job guarantee? Well, with the job guarantee, uh, as people get hired out of the job guarantee, it, government spending is cut. You're not paying them anymore. And so it, it'll get cut dramatically because you only need maybe 2% of the population in the job guarantee because it's a superior price anchor to inflation because it's a pool of labor that, that business can actually hire from, which Argentina demonstrated, hiring those million people out of this previously non-existent pool. And so it eliminates labor shortages and labor bottlenecks that would otherwise happen even with very high rates of unemployment because the private sector just doesn't want to hire those people. Now, it doesn't do it perfectly, but it does it far better than unemployment. So we're going to see much lower levels of inflation, or let's put it this way, uh, we're certainly not going to see any higher levels of inflation because of the job guarantee. I would say all the, the logic tells you it's going to be lower than otherwise for a given size uh, pool. So if you had 6% unemployment or 6% JGB, you would expect uh, to see lower 
you know, much more price stability with his job, job guarantee than with the unemployment, the pool of unemployed. So uh, therefore, um, if we have a certain level of price stability that we want, it can be achieved with maybe 2% in the job guarantee rather than 5 or 6 or 8% as unemployed. And so what Bill calls the neighbor can be much lower than the neighbor if there is such a thing. Now, there's another reason there is no such thing as the neighbor. And, and there's a situation in the labor market I just want to get out here. Now. And it's all mainstream. It's all game theory. But they just you'll never hear it. And that is the labor market is not a fair game because people need to work to eat. But business only hires if they like the prospects of making profit. So it's not the end of the world if they don't hire somebody. But if somebody doesn't get a job, he can't feed his family. Uh, and again, not in all cases, but at the margin, that's the way it is for people, for unemployed people. So um, even if unemployment's down to 1%, if you're the last guy who hasn't gotten a job, according to this Phillips curve Nehru theory, now you have extreme bargaining power because everybody wants you. It's not true. They only want you if they can get you at a price where they can make a profit. And if you don't take it, you're still going to starve, even if you're the last guy looking for a job. So when you look at the micro level, that whole thing doesn't hold up. Uh, again, because people have to work to eat. Uh, business only hires uh, if it feels like it. And so it's not a fair game. And your first day of game theory will tell you that real wages are going to be uh, gravitate towards subsistence unless there's some form of external support to this, quote, labor market. Okay, and that's exactly what we've seen. When all that support was removed in the 1980s, and you know some of it for good reason, but it wasn't replaced by anything. Suddenly, we saw productivity to continue to go up, and instead of wages following productivity, they flattened out and even went down for a while in real terms. And they're not much different than they were in 1980 right now. And so, uh, you know, and again, there's no dispute about this. This is straight mainstream game theory, and it doesn't get mentioned anywhere that you need support for labor. Now, labor unions are one form of support. And so we've got a lot of uh, progressives pushing for labor unions, but that's a, a tough battle. For one thing, labor is very uh, fragmented now. So you're only gonna get a small portion of labor unions anyway, if you, even if you allowed people, if you made them the center of your centerpiece of your proposals. And then what you see is people in that industry getting more money at the expense of everybody else. And that's not, the way to do it either. And so um, to me, in this economy, the way you support labor is through the job guarantee wage. You, um, because if you make the wage $15 an hour, then that becomes a de facto minimum wage in the economy. If it includes childcare, well, then everybody else has to include childcare or else people aren't going to jump to their job. And they'll, they'll be getting high enough prices for their goods and services so they can afford childcare. Everything will settle into it. This is just a new Marrero we're establishing. If you have two weeks vacation, then everybody's going to have to get two weeks vacation. If you've got health care, which I think should be Medicare for all, but if it's not, you could do it through the job guarantee where everybody has you know, free health care. Well, then business has to compete with it. Now, I'm getting off track, but health care should not be a marginal cost of business. Every economist knows that. I don't mean to be proposing that. But what I'm trying to show is how benefits can be introduced from the bottom up to the entire labor force through the job guarantee compensation package. Uh, which I think works to advance the progressive agenda while supporting labor unions, if I understand the rights, doesn't necessarily support a broad progressive agenda, you know, the way the job guarantee rates does. So I'm not against the labor unions, I'm going to go down, I'm record of that, but I, I don't see it as the, uh, the elegant solution to all these other issues, but it's certainly something that you know, can be supported. I'm not, you know, I do support them, but I don't see it as a solution to these other issues. Okay, thank you. Nick? I think you said uh, you had something. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I found, I saw like an interesting question from Ostro Hayek in the chat. He said, what do you think of the Europe sovereign debt crisis and how can monetary normality be restored? Okay, so what Europe did is... Um, turned all their national governments into what, what are like U.S. states. So uh, Germany became New York, it was like New York, and Italy and Greece are like California or Massachusetts. And uh, we wrote about this in 1996, had a conference on it, 
Bretton Woods, had a lot of central bankers and other people, explained exactly what's going to happen. I've got a uh, paper that I wrote on that that showed exactly what was going to happen with all the banking crises and in the, in the sovereign debt. So this is, hey, it's been no mystery. When Bloomberg wrote about the people who got it right, the nine people, I think, I think I was on it, but at least six of them were people who got it for me and were at that conference. Okay, so, uh, you know, maybe more, I don't remember. So it, it was because I tried to get everybody who I thought had some inkling of what was going on together to try and prevent it from happening. So uh, the central, the federal government in the U.S. runs these deficits, 28 trillion. The states don't. The states have to balance their budgets because they, they don't spend first and then collect tax. They have to get dollars in first by taxing or borrowing, just like you and I, just like businesses, they're currency users. And the governments in Europe turn themselves into what are like the U.S. states. And the ECB, the Europe CP, and Central Bank became like the Federal Reserve, the currency issuer, exactly much like ours. The institutional structure is very close. And the European Parliament is much like Congress, but with dramatically reduced powers where it doesn't run a deficit. So Europe walked into this situation where all their states had these massive deficits, except um, I think Luxembourg, you know, because they had never had their own currency. They'd always used French francs or something. So they were like a US state already and never allowed to run this. Was it, was it Luxembourg or Belgium? It was, it was Belgium. Anyway, um, it was a long time ago. They, uh, so it was like if the US states had gotten together like they did under the Articles of Confederation initially. They all had their large state debts, and suddenly they weren't the issue of the currency anymore that Washington was. It's dysfunctional, and they switched to the Constitution, and the whole public debt thing shifted up to the level of the issue of the currency, which was the federal government, and there's never been a problem since. And so uh, in Europe, the way to solve that problem, and one of our solutions early on was to transfer all the public debt to the European Central Bank. Well, they were never going to do that. That would have solved it. The other thing you can do is to have the European Central Bank guarantee the debt of all the member nations, in which case they could run up any size debt they want and they would not have a financial problem. But they don't want to do that either because of the moral hazard. If you do that, then it becomes a race to the bottom because then whichever country runs up the most debt, gets the most spending, the most services, wins. And you just get you know, hyperinflation from excess demand that we've, I've said I've never seen happen. But we would have seen it if they did that. So, uh, and the other major problem was they had the national governments provided the uh, deposit insurance for their banks. So that's like California insuring the deposits of Bank America, Citibank being insured by New York State. Well, that doesn't work either because as soon as you have a banking crisis, the state can't do that. It can't, you know, the whole thing collapses. It has to be the FDIC at the federal government level where they can write any check they want, credit anybody's account. Uh, you know, otherwise, the deposits are not secure. And that's exactly what happened in the European Union. They hit the 2008 hit and they had a banking crisis and the national governments are supposed to guarantee the deposits. They couldn't do it. And it just went downhill from that. And uh, they had to borrow independently of the central bank, just like the states in the U.S. do. And we've had problems with Massachusetts and California, where interest rates go up in Illinois and Chicago and some municipalities where they can't borrow and some municipalities have gone into default. I think Ohio defaulted in 1835 or six or something. Uh, and, uh, and that's exactly what happened in Europe. So it's all described uh, by MMT's framework for analysis. It was all very predictable. And, and we predicted how they're going to solve it. The ECB has to write the check. There's no other way to do it. And in 2012, when the spreads were going out, they were risking insolvency and the euro falling apart. Mario Draghi made that famous statement, said the ECB is going to write the check. He said, you know, we will do what it takes to prevent default. Governments will not default in their bonds. Well, now they become as safe as treasury bonds and interest rates will come down. So I was at a financial conference in Rimini at the time. And I got the question about what was going to happen. I said, well, interest rates are going to come down, but the national economies are going to get worse. They're going to come down because of the guarantee, which they did. But why did the economies get worse? Because these governments, you know, Italy's debt to GDP is over 100%. So when their interest rates came down from 7 to 1, 
that's a, a drop, a massive drop in government spending of 6% of GDP over time. And uh, that, that's bad for the economy. You know, that's like a remove that much income from the economy. And that's what they've been struggling with ever since. The, the lower rates uh, reduce government spending, which is good for their appearance of the government's balance sheet, but it's bad for their economies because it's reducing deficit spending. And their deficits come down, and they think that's good. And But the economy gets worse because the deficit comes down, and then it goes back up because people can't pay the taxes, and they're in the same downward spiral. And they're struggling with that again right now. You know, my proposal was for the, uh, I wrote a paper that was published in a mainstream journal, so it's not heterodox anymore. It's straight mainstream, peer-reviewed journal of policy models. That the, um, because the job guarantee uh, enhances price stability and because the European Central Bank is in charge of price stability, mandated price stability, the European Central Bank should fund a job guarantee and uh, to enhance the price stability in Europe and also to uh, remove that expense of unemployment from the national governments and uh, to allow you know, adequate aggregate demand, which would come in this case, partially through the European Central Bank funding the job guarantee to uh, support growth in European and prosperity in the European Union. And uh, so does that answer your question about the Eurozone? Uh, yes, that, that was really good. Thank you. Um, uh, Teddy, do you wanted to go next? Yeah, um, I uh, actually wanted to continue on the Eurozone. So specifically for Greece, um, yeah. what would you suggest yeah. that uh, Greece does you know, following the economic crisis? You know, should they stay in the Eurozone and potentially be like constrained by this permanent, like, uh, or permanently constrained by like, you know, this European monetary policy? Or should they leave and face the consequence of, you know, not being able to sustain an industrial production to the level of like Germany or France, or perhaps like retaliation from like the Eurozone or the EU? So what would be the next course of action? Yeah. So the problem in Greece is there's no political will to leave the Eurozone. People don't want to do it. They, they, there was a survey taken right after or during the crisis. Do you want the you know, Greek government to run your money, the drac go back to the drachma, or do you want the Germans to run your money in the Euro? You know, it's like 70% said they want the Germans to run the Euro. So the run the money. So so it's, it comes back to that problem I talked about before, which is it's not intuitively obvious that the euro is the problem in Greece. Greece has had problems before. When they were on the drachma, they didn't know how to operate it, you know, the way I've been speaking. They have had problems when the junta took over and they've had military takeovers and they've had you know, interest rates up in the 20s and 30% or whatever, and they've had unemployment up high levels and they had massive inflation and they had the currency collapse and they've seen that all before. They've seen massive corruption at the governmental level uh, where people take the local currencies, sell it for insiders, take it, sell it through the banking system, sell it for foreign exchange, get hard currency, but they call hard currency for themselves and just let the currency depreciate continuously, much like Venezuela is doing, much like what happens, you know, most of the countries that have inflation problems. It's, it's, it's insiders who get holds of vast sums from the banking system, never to pay it back and just sell it for foreign exchange, drive the foreign exchange rate down, drive up the cost of imports. The government then pays more for everything because imported prices went up and the inflationary spiral is underway. And that's what's happened all across Latin America. And much of the world today is still struggling with that. Turkey, State owned, through state-owned enterprises and other types of things. So anyway, we're back to Greece. So um, you say, well, what about the euro and the unemployment? Well, they've seen unemployment before. It's been this bad or worse. They say, look, but this crisis is different. We didn't have inflation. Interest rates are low. And um, somebody wants to buy a house, they can get a mortgage at a low rate. In fact, they're out of work. It's a different story. And the currency didn't go down. When we travel, our money is, is we have real money now to spend it. The, the 80% of the people who are working, right? See, this is not so bad. We've seen it's not anything like the crisis as we saw under the drachma. And so, like, why would we want to leave the euro to do that? And they've got the same issue in Italy and the same issue in, you know, 
all, all these other countries where they've seen it a lot worse through mismanagement of their own currency, through their own elected officials who they know personally, they know personally be, to be corrupt. They know personally be, to be thieves who somehow play the political game and get to positions of power and, you know, line their own pockets. And they like having the authority out in Brussels and they like the Germans running the money. And it's a formidable, formidable force to overcome. So you ask, are they better off turning it back to their own elected officials? Depends on who those guys are. It depends on whether they know how their own monetary system works and how to run it, and whether they're going to be running it for the benefit of the population or for the benefit of their friends and family. So you, I can't answer that question until I know which Greek leaders are going to be there, how they're going to be perpetuated, you know, and, and to be able to give you any idea of what's better for Greece. Teddy, you got a follow up? Uh, I don't have a follow up. I had a question on another oh, topic. Gotcha. Go ahead. Okay. Um. So, um, you mentioned uh, Medicare for all. Um, earlier as like a policy that MMT is like usually linked to. You know, progressive policies that people like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren advocate for. Yes. So, like specifically, you know, uh, the price tag for Medicare for all is expected to be like between thirty or forty trillion dollars. Um. So, what would you say that the government's fiscal role would be to? Uh, ensure a uh, efficient transition into Medicare for all without like any sort of inflationary risk or like tendencies. Okay. So if you have, I think that if you, if we just switched lower the age from 65 to zero, didn't charge anybody anything, I think it would be a deflationary event, not an inflationary event. For one thing, 5 million people would lose their jobs who are working as marketing and sales and insurance companies that aren't going to be there anymore. Administration. Uh, the overhead cost for Medicare last I saw was 8% where for the private sector is like 25 or something. So it's about a 500 billion savings is the number I've seen thrown around, which is mostly salaries, which is about, I'll just say 5 million people. So if unemployment's going to go up by 5 million people, why would you raise taxes? Okay, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, the next thing is corporations will no longer be paying for healthcare. And so their costs go down. So that to the extent they're competitive, they want to increase market share, uh, they're going to be lowering the costs of their products and uh, their goods and services that they're selling uh, to be to remain competitive with each other. Now, some of them are not in competitive environments. I understand that. But to the extent that they're competitive, this is going to happen. So you get two major deflationary forces. On the inflationary side, you'd have to have spending increase by people who are saving money to uh, the extent that they creates excess demand and drives up prices. So if corporations have excess money because they're not paying for health care, they're not going to rush out and spend it. If they pay dividends or buy their stock back, that money's going to somebody else. I don't think that if they buy their stock back and money to the pension fund, the stocks are being held by a pension fund, where most of them are, they're going to increase their spending. So I don't, I don't see it as a major increase in spending. People are going to save money, but that just means they're not going to go bankrupt. I'm not sure how many people are going to increase their spending because their health care costs go down some. Okay, and they might not do it right away. And they might do things like instead of using their credit cards, pay out of income. So they'll spend the same, but their debt accumulation. Limit. I'm shifting around because I see this reflection off my glasses. <laughs> Can I just turn a light on so I don't get this reflection? Yeah, yeah. Oh, hold on. of course, yeah. By the way, thank you everyone um, for who's in chat asking questions. Got dark um, outside. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Go ahead okay. whenever you're ready. Okay. So. Uh, okay. So you'd have to show me where you think the channel for inflation is for Medicare for all. I think it's deflationary. So if anything, you'd want to cut taxes or, you know, increase public expenditure on a Green New Deal or something, you know, or public infrastructure or something. I don't see it as, look, if you're driving down the road in a car and you know you're going to turn left in five miles, the exit's five miles ahead, you don't get it over with and turn left now, you're going to crash. Okay, you got to wait to five miles and then make the turn. So fiscal policy is the same way. If you see down the road five years, it might be excess spending, 
you don't cut today's spending or you don't raise taxes today. You, you might want to plan on making a move for five years forward, but you wait until you're actually there. So you have to show me how you think it's going to be inflationary, and then I can address those issues. Um, well, uh, so there are essentially, I guess, two ways where like there might be maybe not necessarily inflation, but like pressures towards like inflation. Uh, one would be like, you know, new government people being employed by government payrolls to sustain the Medicare uh, program. Uh, and second would All be right. potentially an increase in so, demand for like. So let's stop health. there for, let's do them one at a time. Okay. So you're, you're going to have fewer people in healthcare. Medicare needs, you know, it's like it'd be 5 million fewer people. In, in healthcare, they, they employ a lot fewer people than the private sector companies do because they don't have to have sales and marketing and duplicate counting and all that. Okay. So I see employment going, I see unemployment going up. I don't see it going down. Okay, um, so, so what was your second point? Your second point? Um, put like, uh, if there would be like an increased consumption of like these services, so like you know, people, if healthcare were to be free, if they were to tend tend to uh, go to the doctor more, if this would result in like more resources being used by the public sector. Okay, so let me address that. Okay. Today, when I talk to doctors, and it's anecdotal, but I've seen some numbers, they tell me they're spending half their time arguing with insurance companies, and their staff is spending its time. And if they didn't have to do that, if it was just Medicare then there's no arguing with the insurance companies. It actually increases actual doctor patient time by 50% or something like that. So I think it's a big plus there. Second of all, I don't know how many people like going to doctors. is not like going to the movie theater or going swimming or something, you know, going to play golf. If anything, uh, people tend to like avoid going to the doctor. I don't, I don't know that they don't. There are people who don't go when they need it because of what it costs, but they wind up going to a emergency room, which has, is not ready for it. It's got a lot more staff, a lot more real costs than going to the proper facility where you would otherwise have to pay. So there might be some of that, but I, I don't see it being material. Uh, I think Aiden had a question. Actually, you know, before that, um, unless Teddy wants something else, um, I think there's one question in chat and I'll let Aiden go and then we're going to we're going to run out of time. So go ahead, Aiden. You're still there. Right. Uh, my question is, do you think there are any areas in MMT that needs to be further developed? Well, short answer is no. But this, the longer answer is once you understand this, then there's a lot that has to be developed. So, for example, you got to go back through the Medicare question if you're a politician or if you're an economist for the government or if you're if it's your job to do this to come up with public policy and look at it in real terms the way I've been talking and there's just not a lot of data on that people don't do it we need to look at distribution of real consumption rather than distribution of income because the example I use if there's some you know senior citizen living in a little one-bedroom place with 20 cats who has $50 million in the bank, that money's not you know, a problem for anybody. Okay, the fact that they have more money than anybody else, they're not using up the real resources of the country. Nobody cares. It's not like there's a shortage of money and now we can't have the government spend on you know, health care because this person has money in the bank. The causation is the other way. So, um, but if there's, if there's another person who doesn't have any money, but they're managing to get everything on credit, and taking vacations on private jets and living you know, on super yachts and you burning up real resources, uh, you know that is uh, that is a uh, that's that's real consumption. That person's consuming. So you got to look at what the real consumption is. So if you look at the lowest twenty five percent of income, what percentage of total consumption, of total output are they consuming? Are they you know, they, how many television sets, how many computers, how much food are they eating, and these types of things. And what happens is the real numbers become more important than the financial numbers. The financial numbers are ways to make sure you have social equity in the real numbers, that everybody has enough to eat, that everybody has a good education, that everybody has good public health. And then the amount of money you have or don't have, it 
becomes less important. It still can be an issue to the extent that buys political influence, but I have proposals for that also. I've been doing this a long time. I have proposals for just about everything. So, so right, that, that, that answer your question. So I don't think that MMT itself, the framework needs a lot more development. I think it's more that it suddenly creates this need to develop all these other uh, fields, all these other economic models need to be redone. The assumptions need to be changed. They got to get rid of the intertemporal budget constraint from their, you know, intertemporal models, things like that. All right, and one more question, I think. Uh, I like to, the, most of them already answered that question kind of earlier, um, but there's one more. It says, what do you think about the European Green New Deal to promote employment and restart economies of the, of the euro? Uh, I don't know that much about it, but. Okay. It, you uh, know, I, I, don't, I don't see anything except some long-term investments. I, I don't see any of these immediate things to keep the economy from reopening in non-essentials to keep levels where they are now. Let me, so, let me try yeah. another one. I, just, I, keep, I keep messing up on these. Uh, how about this one? Can Warren talk about corporate taxes if they are regressive? Yeah. Oh, hi, Michael. So they, uh, yeah. So I don't think there are any economists who think you should tax corporations because it, it's just a pass-through to the people who are buying them what they're selling, and that's you, which usually makes them regressive because most of them are selling to uh, people among all the income um, groups. And so the, people, the buyers, the customers who are clients in the lower income groups are paying a larger percentage of their income for that product because of the taxing than they would otherwise. So corporate taxes tend to be highly regressive. Corporations are just pastors. The problem is they get personified. You know, that person, like, you know, this corporation is a bad person or something. It's just a piece of paper. It's a government uh, license to operate. It's ultimately under control of the government. Uh, if they're not behaving for public purpose, Congress can change that. They can change all the laws and force the laws. Uh, it, you're, I think we're just barking up the wrong trees when we try to uh, compel corporations into uh, doing things that are not required by law. It's what well, what we should be doing is making sure the law is there to require it, and then then they're going to be in compliance. Very few corporations deliberately break the law. Some do, and uh, the principles involved in doing that should be personally held personally liable and jailed or whatever. But um, the corporation itself is just a, a pastoral entity that's populated by people who are coming and going all the time. Um. I, I just had a one question. Uh, what are your, uh, I know Pavlina, like a, I'm a big fan of her work uh, and she doesn't necessarily agree with like a UBI or basic income. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts on like a UBI or basic income were. Yeah. You know, I'm not categorically against it. And I understand the, 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 comp the complexity of today's institutional structure is what's driving it to, to kind of simplify what we've got. Uh, but it's, it's what I call playing with fire. So let's go back to our situation where the government puts a tax on everybody's house. The government wants to provision itself. It wants employees. So it puts a tax on everybody's house. And then it gives you, if you come to work for the government, it pays you. And, and so people go to work for the government, get the money and pay the tax. The government says, look, we'll give you enough money so you don't have to work. And then how do you get anybody to work for the government? Okay, so you can't do that. You can't pay a living wage with UBI or else you risk the, the scenario where nobody works and government can't provision itself and the currency is worthless. You have hyperinflation and it can happen very quickly if you pass that point. So if, if you stay beneath that point where it's not enough to pay the tax, let's say it's enough to pay half the tax. Well, what you've done is just cut taxes in half, but it's not one for one. It's not the same people who have the tax in their house that are getting UBI. So I understand that that institutional structure might make some of that um, make sense in a small way, but not to the point. It, again, it's playing with fire because if you pay, if you have UBI to the point where it's a living wage, you can, you're risking a, a total collapse of the whole financial system and very quickly. So uh, keeping that in mind, I can discuss the UBI, where it's appropriate, how much and whatnot. But you have to understand that 
you know, what you're up against. Thank awesome. you. I really appreciate it. I think with that, um, this was a wonderful forum and I want to thank Mr. Mosley for coming on. Um, I want to thank everyone here from the forum and, um, you know, we had some really, you know, good answers and good questions on here today. Uh, so with that, I think we're going to end the stream. Uh, let me just take this off so I can see my face. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, I just want to, you know, thank you for coming on. This was amazing. Um, Franklin says, tell Moser, I love him. Uh, <laughs> <in a way. laughs> so Do you have my um, email. Do you have my email? If you have any further questions. I think War Nick yeah, warren.mosler at gmail.com. Very simple. Yeah. yeah. But otherwise, I, thank you guys for coming and I'm on. on. I'm on Twitter. You can message me there. <laughs> WB Mosler. Right. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Thank you, thank you for organizing. Twitter. You've done a great job and uh, keep fighting a good fight. Uh, and by the way, Mosler's Twitter and uh, website is in the description, so you can go and visit those. All right. But well, thank you guys, and we'll see you later. Thank Bye. you so thank much you. for coming.